Greetings and welcome to Masterclass Module 2, Cellular Metabolism and Digestion. Here's a brief review on embryology. This is the time from fertilization of the egg by the sperm when the baby develops. There are 23 pairs of chromosomes. All the cells within the egg become differentiated into three layers. The ectoderm, which forms the brain and nervous system. The mesoderm, which forms the muscular skeletal system. The connective tissues, the blood and circulatory system, lymphoid tissue, and the genital urinary tract. And the endoderm, which forms the lining of the gastrointestinal tract, respiratory system, and some endocrine glands. Of course, diet and lifestyle of the mother is very important at this time. I recommend folic acid every day for the formation of the neural tube. Folic acid is found in many foods, but it is often not enough during pregnancy. About 400 micrograms per day is a good supplement amount. Mammal cells differ from plants in that human cells have a membrane, whereas plants and bacteria have cell walls. The cell membrane is semi-permeable, composed of a double layer of phospholipid molecules. The phosphate group faces outside, thus the membrane is hydrophilic or water-loving, and the fatty group is on the inside and is hydrophobic. The cell membrane must have a certain amount of flexibility, but also structure and stiffness. Cholesterol molecules are perfect for this structure. Transporter proteins are there to move nutrients in and waste out. The constituents of all these molecules are phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylinositol, phosphatidylserine, and phosphatidylethanolamine. It is this structure that makes antibiotic therapy possible. Bacteria have a cell wall instead of a cell membrane, so the healthy immune cells are not affected by an antibiotic but the bacterial wall is destroyed. The cell membrane must be semi-permeable so the nutrients for mo cell metabolism can get in and the products of cell metabolism can get out. This is all aided, of course, by pumps along the cell membrane itself. It is very important to know that the cell membrane has sodium and potassium on either side of the membrane. This way, the cell can change the outer and inner cellular environments and it's balanced by the movement of the sodium and potassium ions. The cellular structure includes the cytoplasm, which is a lattice-like structure outside the nucleus. It contains ribosomes, fluid, and supports and controls the movement of the other contents within the cell. Organelles are subcellular structures within the cytoplasm. They carry out specific metabolic functions. The nucleus is the largest. The nucleus is the major organelle in every cell. It contains chromatin or chromosomes. Chromosomes are structures in the nucleus made up of proteins containing DNA, which direct all life. This is the double helix. Genes are located on the DNA. They are the specific instructions needed to build a protein. Proteins come together to build cells, which come together to build tissues, which come together to build the organs. What's in the cytoplasm? There is a rough endoplasmic reticulum. This is an intracellular folded membrane. This is where protein synthesis takes place. Also within the cytoplasm, there is a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. This is a folded membrane specializing in the synthesis of lipid-based compounds such as sex hormones. Lysosomes break down waste products in the catabolic process. Mitochondria are the energy-producing centers where we find the Krebs cycle. The Golgi apparatus are tubular membranes to secrete substances from the cell into the body, such as hormones, sweat, and tears. In this amazing little factory called the cell, all metabolism takes place. It's the sum total of all biochemical and electrical processes that go on in living cells. 
When the body is requiring vitamins and enzymes or amino acids, the cell builds or synthesizes the necessary molecules. The cells use energy from glucose and amino acid or lipids to accomplish this. This is called an anabolic process. When the cell breaks glucose, glycerol, fatty acids, or amino acids down into carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, or other elements, it's called catabolism. Balance is an important word in nutrition and in all natural medicine. Balance means homeostasis. When the body is in balance or homeostasis, there is acid alkaline balance a healthy body temperature, there is equilibrium between anabolic and catabolic activity, a balance between sodium and potassium electrolytes. There is a continuous supply of fuel to make energy, and there is an accurate balance between hormones and neurotransmitters to communicate with all the body's cells. There are usually many questions about acid and alkaline. The measure of pH is the relative measure of hydrogen ions. The blood pH is about 7.4 and our bodies are very efficient at maintaining this pH. Yes, it does take more energy to try to move hydrogen and hydroxyl ions around to make this balance. So you are benefited by eating more alkaline or close to 7.4. There is a list in the blog that tells exactly what foods are more closely alkaline. But if you look at the little food preparation guide, the whole grains are most neutral and things such as sugar and meat are more acidic. You can do as much as you can to eat healthy and usually it will be easier on your body to keep a pH of 7.4. By the way, the pH of the stomach has a range of about 1.5 to 4.8. It is very acidic environment, and it has to be that way for digestion. We will go into this in more detail shortly. Drinking alkaline water is very unlikely to have an effect on your pH. Just as our lungs accomplish respiration, the movement of oxygen from the outside environment into our metabolism through our bloodstream, cellular respiration utilizes quite a number of processes to accomplish respiration in the cell like glycolysis or glucose splitting cycle, or the Krebs cycle, the electron transport cycle, the urea cycle, the Cori cycle, and the ketone cycle, all manage respiration within the cells. On every cell membrane, there is a calcium magnesium pump and a sodium potassium pump. This is a schematic way that we can see how all these are interdependent in short, the oxidation of nutrients and waste products and the release of waste products by these cycles result in ATP, which is equal to energy. Do cells get old? Yes, but they always reproduce themselves. These are the causes of cell death, nutritional deficiency or imbalance, extended or severe hydration, endogenously produce toxins, excessive activity of free radicals, which equals oxidation, anoxia or the absence of oxygen, normal wear and tear called apoptosis. Cancer pharmaceuticals target cells which have reproduced out of control. Many of these medicines target specific organelles in the cell to facilitate cell death. The goal is to balance life with death, a very delicate process indeed. So we're speaking a little bit about how food is digested. We talk about enzymes and how there's 50,000 enzymatic reactions going on in our body all the time. This doesn't mean that you need to take enzymes to digest your food. When you're chewing your food in your mouth, amylase is re released in your saliva, and this enzyme starts the the breakdown of carbohydrates in your mouth. We also secrete different things like proteases and lipases to break down proteins and fats. This happens as your food goes through your digestive tract. 
lots of things are made with enzymes. One thing is miso, for instance. This is a fermented soybean product. And um, it's a good demonstration of how enzymes work because this started as a bean that was cooked and then adding some um, catalase, something like an enzyme. It works on the proteins in the bean, which is the substrate. And it's like a lock and key. That little enzyme just opens those proteins to be semi-digested and turned into this nice creamy soup base that makes a, a soup that's both nutritious and vital for our health. So we're just gonna use a little bit of bone broth and put some veggies to cook with the bone broth and a little bit of seaweed to add flavor and lots of nutrients. We'll cook that, and when it's cooked, we'll add some of this fermented soybean miso. And this will be a good way for your digestion to be activated as you warm your palate and enzymes start to be released in the eating process. Another great way to make sure that your food is digested with enzymes is to chew very well. Lots of foods don't taste good when you chew very well. But if you find foods that like whole grains and certain meats and proteins and veggies, when you chew them well, they actually get sweeter and more tasty. So go ahead and try some different things, but be sure to chew well and let your digestive enzymes work. Before we enlarge this information into a study of the GI system, it is essential to understand that all the reactions and activities that happen in the body are enzyme driven. Vitamins are coenzymes. Certain vitamins make the process of enzyme actions possible. Every substrate has a particular enzyme and there are certain rate limiting factors to all reactions. Essentially, the gastrointestinal system is a long tube. It starts with the mouth where food is chewed and certain enzymes are released. Amylase for carbohydrates and lipase for fats. There are salivary glands, taste buds, tongue, and also sublingual glands to facilitate the absorption and swallowing that occurs from the mouth. During the time in the mouth, fluids are separated from solids and the fluids swallowed as the food is masticated. It is important to chew well, 30 to 50 times per bite. Oral pathologies include thrush or candida, periodontal disease, tooth decay and loss, halitosis, bleeding gums, loss of tooth enamel, temporal mandibular malfunctions, tartar, stroke, aspiration pneumonia, aphthose ulcers, and herpes 1. These nutrients may help offset oral diseases. Vitamin B complex, vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, boron, silica, and L-lysine. The most important discipline you can have is good dental health habits, flossing and brushing every day. When the food is swallowed, it's called a bolus. The bolus movement is facilitated by the epiglottis, the swallowing reflex, the esophageal sphincter, and the cardiac sphincter. Goblet epithelial cells secrete a mucus that helps move the products of digestion through the tube. The enzymes that were, re were released from the chewing process continue to help digesting the bolus as it goes through the esophagus. In the stomach, the bolus enters as chyme. The stomach is full of hydrochloric acid, which makes for a very low pH. Pepsin, gastrin, lipase, renin, and lactase, intrinsic factors, secretin, and cholecystokinin, as well as the muscles, are all important in the stomach. Here, proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates are digested. The nutrients are B6 and 12 are very important. Certain pathologies in the stomach are indigestion, nausea, vomiting, hiatal hernia, GERD or reflux, gastritis or bleeding ulcers. There are many pharmaceuticals that target the digestion, especially stomach problems such as gastritis and reflux. Proton pump inhibitors may help buffer the acidity in the stomach for a period of time 
Unfortunately, they interfere with every other proton pump in the body. Use prescription drugs for short periods of times, two weeks at the most, and in that time, adjust the diet so that the affected tissues will be healthier. Make changes in your diet by removing spicy, fatty, and greasy foods and carbonated beverages. A little apple cider vinegar may help. Often stomach, the stomach doesn't have enough acid. Other healing modalities have a lot of information and a lot of wisdom. In traditional Chinese medicine, they call the gastrointestinal system the jiao, specifically the middle jiao, or the area of transportation and transformation. These ideas are related to the spleen and stomach. Primarily, the spleen is related to transportation and transformation. Everything is changed and moved by its workings, and the stomach is called the sea of grain and water. Essentially, these activities are considered to make blood and vitality. The spleen has an energetic suctioning effect and prevents food from falling downward. The earth requires fire and water, and so does the spleen. So it's best to eat cooked foods, like brown rice, sorghum, chestnut, pumpkin, lamb, and millet. It is also good wisdom to know that the spleen is affected by overthinking. So thinking about your diet and all the details of your food can have a counterproductive effect. In the small intestine, the acid chyme from the stomach passes through the pyloric sphincter. And when the duodenum, it triggers the pancreas to release biocarbonate. This starts to alkalize the digestion and emulsification of fats. Water and oil don't mix, so this is where the fat particles are broken down into smaller and smaller molecules. Peristalsis moves the chyme through the duodenum, which secretes the hormone cholecystokinin, then to the jejunum, and then the ileum. Note that the pancreas supports the breakdown of lipids. Without good pancreatic health, you'll end up with greasy, smelly stools that may float. This is a sign of pancreatic inflammation and malabsorption. In the small intestine, trypsin and chymotrypsin trypsin from the pancreas break down protein. Lipase from the pancreas breaks down the lipids, and the fat in the chyme communicates to cholecystokinin and secretin, which gives a satiation signal to the brain. Amylase breaks down the carbohydrates, and stepsin, erypsin, and lactase work to break down milk for children. Many people lose this lactase as they grow older, and many people are born without the gene to make lactase. The brain also receives messages from the fat cells when they secrete leptin. This message can be blocked by high fructose corn syrup. That's why eating foods made with that particular fructose molecule, now known as fruit syrup, and various other names, rarely fill you up and keep you coming back for more. The small intestine lining has features that increase the surface area for absorption. You can imagine 32 feet of folds and microvilli that move things through. That's a lot of surface area for absorption. There are also blood vessels and lymph and cells that produce hormones and enzymes. This is called the brush border. In the small intestines, there are patches along the small intestines called the enteric nervous system. Small intestines are so underappreciated, especially when you realize that 90% of the serotonin that your body needs as the feel-good molecule is made in your small intestines by the enteric nervous system. The other 10% of the serotonin is carried on platelets throughout your body. I think it's important to consider the environment of the small intestine as having a significant influence on the production of serotonin. In traditional Chinese medicine, the small intestine is considered a paired organ with the heart. It's understandable that in Chinese medicine, the heart is considered to be the mind. And with the way the serotonin is produced in the small intestine, the connection is apparent. 
The small intestine disorders that could affect our overall health are dysbiosis or an intestinal flora imbalance. There's also leaky gut, duodenal ulcers, candidiasis, Crohn's and celiac disease, parasites and worms, and for people who have had bariatric surgery, difficulties with the absorption of certain nutrients. Imbalance of the small intestine can also be evident with the intestinal gas and bloating. There can be ileocecal valve dysfunction. The ileocecal valve pain is an area that is often mistaken for appendicitis and vice versa. Avoid cured bacon, butter, candy, canned soup, canned veggies, fried food, hot dogs, high fat snacks, ice cream, lard, mayonnaise, potato chips, salt, sugar, red meat, saturated fats, and whole milk, if you have any of those symptoms. The sodium nitrites and nit nitrates in deli meats is particularly difficult on the absorption from the small intestine because it causes free radicals, which cause oxidation and putrefaction of the protein foods. The small and large intestine is so important for good health. Now the chyme is called the feces and enters the large intestine. It's moved along the large intestine by fiber and water as well as peristaltic action. Vitamin K is synthesized in the colon. Waste is eliminated through the rectum to the anus. Water and nutrients continue to be absorbed and it's especially important to have fiber to continue to move things along. Disorders of the large intestine include diverticulosis or weakness of the muscle layer which is usually occurs in the sigmoid area, usually aggravated by nuts and seeds. Inflammatory bowel disease, the best way to avoid this is to avoid refined carbs, lactose, caffeine, alcohol, high fat foods, sorbitol, spicy foods, and fructose. That will help you avoid those problems as well as stricture of the bowel, ulceration of the bowel, diarrhea, constipation, coleostomies and ileostomies and hemorrhoids. So speaking of digestion, there's quite a number of aspects to keep your digestive tract healthy. Um, one of the things that we spoke about was having fermented foods, good healthy fermented foods. So there's things like fermented cabbage, a cultural dish called kimchi, or sauerkraut and pickles. These are all well fermented if they're naturally prepared. You can tell by shaking it and seeing it get cloudy. That means that there's good probiotics in there. We also talked about miso, which has even some probiotics with it. Or you can take a probiotic vitamin. Sometimes your good flora just needs a good base to grow on. So things like flaxseed and other fibrous foods give a good base for probiotics to grow on. The um, interesting thing is, is it's been discovered that if all your um, probiotics have been killed in some way or they've gotten unhealthy, um, you can actually get more probiotics to populate your intestinal tract right from your own appendix. Your appendix is a little storehouse for all the flora that you need. And as soon as your body senses that you don't have any good flora, it will put a little squirt of its contents and repopulate the entire intestinal tract. One of the things that ha can happen in that process of losing your good flora is opportunistic fungus can grow inside the intestines and that makes little holes. This means that undigested food can fall out of the intestinal tract and into the omentum and be, um, go back up into the liver. The liver sees it as a toxin and can make you feel sleepy or groggy or out of it. So you want to make sure that you have good, healthy digestion. One of the other ways to keep your liver healthy is by drinking a little lemon juice in the morning. Just squeeze some lemon with water and drink that before you eat. 
One of the biggest problems in our culture today is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that's caused by eating too many of those saturated fats that we talked about. Fast foods cause this, and many children suffer with this non-alcoholic liver disease. Please protect your family by eating good, um, simple uh, seed oils and good fermented foods. The nutrients for the large intestine is most importantly fiber and lots of water, eight to 13 glasses per day. If you need to use over-the-counter psyllium husk for fiber, drink it with lots of water. There's also a good herbal laxative called trifola. Also be sure to chew well all your complex carbohydrates so you can have that good fiber. If you're particularly troubled with your digestion, take a few days of just eating those complex carbohydrates like well-cooked brown rice to stimulate colon activity. Also avoid all junk food. The pancreas performs three functions. It's got an exocrine component which produces biocarbonate, pancreatic amylase, pancreatic lipase, and the proteases trypsin and chymotrypsin. It is also an endocrine gland that controls glucose levels in the blood by releasing insulin and glucagon as needed. The pancreas also surveils the immune system. The pancreas is quite sensitive to chemicals. Even the air deodorizers that are not natural can endanger the pancreas as well. Pharmaceutical drugs are also hard on the pancreas. The most common disorders of the pancreas are pancreatitis, pancreas cancer, and cystic fibrosis. The liver is a part of the gastrointestinal system. It receives nutrients from the blood and then metabolizes, stores, and releases them into the bloodstream. Whenever they're needed, they are transported. The liver manufactures bile, synthesizes albumin, cholesterol, and lipoproteins, HDL and LDL. It also makes carrier proteins and some clotting factors and vitamin D. The liver stores excess glycogen as glucagon and converts it back to glucose and releases it as needed into the bloodstream. It recycles iron from heme from old red blood cells and manufactures new red blood cells. It also has detoxification phases. The liver packages ammonia. However, when the liver is starting to fail, it's not able to package ammonia. It's carried to the brain and it causes a type of coma called a hepatic coma. It is very important for the body to be rid of excess ammonia. The normal medication for this is called laculose. It is a liquid form that helps the ammonia go out through the stool. The liver also eliminates excess hormones, and it is for this reason that during menopause, there are many emotional feelings attached to the hormone changes. The nutrients important for the liver are vitamin A, C, B complex, zinc, iron, copper, milk thistle, if the liver has been detoxed, and glutathione and beet juice, especially in alcoholic syndrome where there's a type of dementia called Wernicke-Korsakoff. This causes the, alcohol, the alcoholic to make up stories or confabulate. To avoid this, thiamine or B1 is added to the drinking spirits in most civilized countries. Disorders of the liver include cirrhosis, hepatitis, jaundice, fatty liver, ascites, and edema. Liver diseases can be reversed just as the entire liver can be regenerated from transplanted pieces. It takes some time and the right kind of nutritional environment. The gallbladder is connected to the liver by the biliary tract through which it releases bile salts. These salts are synthesized in the liver and stored in the gallbladder right under the right lobe of the liver. It is released into the duodenum in response to fats in the chyme. This sig signals the gallbladder to release the bile into the duodenum. The nutrients for the gallbladder include vitamin A, C, E, B6, magnesium, and essential fatty acids. Please note that bile is recycled. 
that's why it's difficult to get rid of too much cholesterol. The bile uses cholesterol to move hormones around and recycle them. But unfortunately, they cannot be taken out of circulation except with a medicine called cholestyramine. This may be important in times when there is a bacterial or fungal toxin that is attached to the bile salts and need to be removed to remove symptoms of illness. Disorders of the gallbladder include gallstones, which is from a high fat intake combined with a high intake of carbohydrates. This disrupts the body's calcium metabolism and may start the formation of stones. Stones are made up of cholesterol and calcium. Suddenly stopping a low fat diet may also trigger the formation of gallstones and a gallstone attack. Magnesium and B6 may help to break them down. Fat in the stool may be coming from pancreatic imbalance and complicated by a gallbladder weakness. Consequently, you may have a soapy substance in the stool and it will be containing large amounts of unabsorbed nutrients. Pancreatic enzymes and betaine hydrochloride may take the load off these organs enough to heal. Recent research shows that the appendix is not just a vestigial organ. The appendix is there because it contains the exact types of probiotic flora for your body. And in case of some problem where your probiotics, your flora and fauna, have been eliminated, say by an antibiotic, the appendix will give a little squeeze and secrete just the right amount of new probiotic so that your body can reproduce and keep a healthy intestinal tract. Currently, there is an increase in small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Nutrients are being lost as absorption is impaired. A breath test can be diagnostic. A good approach is a natural antibiotic like tricycline. A tip from this module, in short, is an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Not only do apples contain fiber, but it also has B2 for hair and nails. And malic acid helps to control the gallbladder's disposition to make gallstones. And last but not least, the peel of a good organic apple is extremely nutrient rich and even can protect you from the carcinogenic effects of cooked meat. Thank you, and I look forward to sharing Module 3, The Immune System, with you soon.